back to this Black Hat Fast Chat video series. I'm Terry Sweeney, contributing editor with Black Hat, and I'm joined today by Hank Schles, Senior Manager of Security Solutions for Lookout. Hank, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, Terry. Thanks, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to chat. Um, so our, our topic uh, concerns mobile security, and it is a curious thing that there isn't more news or headlines about cyber attacks that affect mobile users, both smartphones and tablets. Give us some insight there. Why do you think that happens? Well, I think there are a few levels to it, Terry. I think that um, you know the first part of it is that attackers do use mobile devices as that vulnerable entry point into uh, backend infrastructure to access company data, cons I mean, considering how much of it is actually stored on devices, much less accessed through uh, some you know, cloud services and all that, cloud-based services um, from mobile devices. But you know, I really think it's because people don't have the visibility they need you know, to include mobile devices in basically that, that endpoint detection response or EDR process when it comes to threat hunting and instant investigation, some of the post-mortem stuff that happens when an incident does occur. Um, which, which is interesting because everyone has at least one mobile device. I mean, you know, whether it's a, a personal phone and a work phone or uh, a phone and a tablet, um, not only are they, do you have multiple devices, but you also have personal devices, you have corporate devices, you have managed, unmanaged, there's a whole swath of these things. Um, and it's just, you know, I think we don't hear about it because people just don't really have the visibility they need to uh, see that these devices are actually a pretty uh, consistent entry point for, for malicious attackers. Thanks for that. I think that's good context. Um, what about the actual threat landscape? I mean, the the, the malware and the, the the threats and the risk have to be out there, just as they are with any other connected device. Mm -hmm. What does the threat landscape look like for mobile devices? Uh, vast, to put it in one word. <laughs> um, it's uh, you know, it's I was I was talking to another another colleague a few weeks ago and. Uh, he, he's been in, he's, he's a few years older than me. He's been in security for longer than I have. And he said, and he's done a lot of, uh, more, you know, he started kind of more in data center security and now is more in, uh, cloud security. And he said, he said mobile security is the biggest problem no one's talking about right now. Um, which, which was interesting. I mean, obviously working for a mobile security company, I was encouraged to hear that, that, you know, he acknowledged that it was a big, it was a big problem, but it is, it is a big issue. And it's one that, uh, Given that threat landscape and what it looks like, people really, uh, I really don't think people are talking about it enough. And and when you look at it, um, when you look at it in, in the past year or so, especially um, remote work really forced some pretty radical adjustments uh, for security teams. Uh, I think it's pretty undeniable. And uh, from a mobile perspective, the first thing people did, the first couple steps, which were the right first steps to take, was you know they increased their VPN licenses and maybe implemented a mobile device manager, MDM, um, which was a great first step. But the problem is that neither of those provide true security to uh, the device. And and in the first 100 days or so of the pandemic, really kind of when, when we, we measured this from when work from home really started, we actually saw almost a 30% increase in the use of mobile devices by remote workers so people were obviously relying on these devices. Now, in terms of what the landscape actually looks like, um, mobile phishing has been the, the biggest and most quickly growing issue uh, for, for a couple of years now. But really, we saw it in the beginning of, of 2020 and through the year. Um, we saw, uh, I think it was, I, I wrote a report on this, I think it was almost a 40% increase in mobile phishing between the last quarter of 2019 and the end of the first quarter of 2020. Um, so obviously there was use of, uh, of the pandemic, you know, to, to socially engineer people. Um, but even since it's cooled off a little bit since then, it's still significantly higher than it was last year. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to go into some, some industry stats and all that as well, but yeah, please dive in. Yeah. What's up? Good question there. Um, do, do, do users of mobile devices somehow think, Oh, I'm I'm handled with phishing. I, I use it on my laptop. I don't need to worry about it with my mobile. Like I, I just that doesn't make sense to me. But shine some light there, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it, I think that people know that phishing is always an issue. But since these since smart, you know, like our phones are so personal, right? And so we we inherently trust them to be safe. 
Right. We, you know, especially, you know, and this is not this is not throwing shade by any means, but, you know, there's sort of this perception that that iPhones are are completely safe and they don't need anything else. Well, if you look at some of the bigger uh, issues this year, a lot of it had to do with with, you know, Apple operating systems being released with some pretty serious vulnerabilities and all that. At the same time, you know, the same thing happened on the Android side. But I think it's also that um, when you look at what phishing looks like on mobile, attackers really do use social engineering a lot more frequently. And honestly, they've gotten really good at it to the point where even the best train, if you train your employees on, on or an individual trains themselves on how to spot how to spot a phishing attack on PC or on a computer, it's going to look nothing like that on a mobile device, especially when it comes through something like a personal social media app or or something like that. Right. As you scan the the threat horizon for mobiles, what do you see? What's what's really informing that picture? Yeah, I mean, I think the the number one thing right now, I think, is privacy um, on on is on everyone's mind. I mean, you look at what Apple has done in the last year or so, requiring developers to put the uh, the nutrition labels um, of, uh, of of data access and privacy on their applications, and um, you know, I think that that's really put, and, and and you know, you look at like the privacy issues around things like uh, like TikTok last year and and some of the international implications there. Um, I think that ended up being a little bit of a bigger deal than it really was, but it did shine light on the fact that that people are again trust these devices to be safe. They trust the app developers to implement safe practices. And sometimes, you know, sometimes there's something that, from a personal perspective, might not seem that bad. Like, do I really care if if my audio recordings from a social media app are going to a server in China? I mean, as long I'm. I'm I'm not playing on saying anything, sure. anything damning or anything uh, that isn't already public knowledge. So, so not really. But from a from a corporate perspective, that might be a huge violation of some sort of internal or international policy. Well, so you've got you've got mobile phone makers installing, mm -hmm. ba baking it really into the, the the device itself, baking good security, privacy, etc. Mm -hmm. Users still seem reluctant to go that extra mile to to install privacy and protections on, on their phones mm -hmm. while well, they, they wouldn't give it a second thought for their, their desktops or their laptops. How, how do you explain that disconnect? I mean, that's one that, uh, that's one that has always, has always shocked me a little bit. Um, you know, to your point, you would never, everyone has at least antivirus of some sort on every computer they've ever had since, you know, since, since forever, really. Um, and, uh, you know, our phones have even more data, even more access than, I mean, I believe than our laptops or our computers have or ever will have. Um, and, you know, I think that, I think there's, there is, I think there's a shift going on. I think people are recognizing the risks that are associated with, with smartphones, tablets, you know, it's great. They enable us for, for everything we, we love to do. They've really become the, the center point of everyone's life. Um, but you look at how, um, you know, how let's just say, for example, Apple has now released the M1 chip in their in their laptops. And actually, I I got one myself a few weeks ago. I love it. It's super fast. It's great. Um, but you look at that, and I think it's one of those signs that, uh, you know, these you know laptops, desktops are moving more towards that mobile operating system um, model. And so when it comes to putting uh, when it comes, sorry, to installing uh, something like uh, you know a, a mobile security product on on a device, especially a personal one, I think people will get more comfortable with that idea as the two things start to look more similar and they get more educated on what uh, on what risks really are out there from a mobile perspective. Shifting gears slightly, there's a there's been a longstanding debate about using uh, solutions or services um, that may be cloud based or that are hosted on your own premises. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen this throughout basically all the IT functions. Um, more recently in security, because people have been a little hesitant to turn over the keys of the kingdom to a, a third party. Uh, I'm wondering if this same cloud-based versus on-prem debate is also raging within the mobility world. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a great question. Um, and it's one that we get uh, a lot. 
um, because it is, it is a big, it is a big question. Um, you know, we've actually, um, we've heard a lot more about it recently, um, with the example of the Microsoft exchange server hack that was exposed, uh, just, you know, just recently and has been, I mean, that's been all over the place. Um, you know, I think we all, we all know about at this point, there were a handful of zero days that were being exploited on or in on-prem versions of, of exchange server. And, you know, you can always say this would happen, that would happen. But in this case, if, you know, if this were a cloud-based service, there would have been patches pushed out within, you know, hours of discovery and, and, and people would be for the most part taken care of. But since you're relying on the individual organizations, and it was, I think it was, it was tens of thousands of organizations using this, uh, you know, right. using this, this on-prem version, they all now have to scramble to, to patch it themselves. Which creates, and you know, you think about the lag time that happens between when the ex, when the exploit is or the vulnerability is exposed, um, you know, attackers start exploiting it, and then you know, there's there's always a lag time when the, between then and when the update happens. So on the on the mobile front, and I think really on the security front as a whole, I think that just this just shows how cloud-based platforms really are a necessity versus their on-premise counterparts. I mean. And the rest of the world has shifted that way. And, you know, especially now with these highly distributed workforces, you know, everyone, you know, whether work from home, you know, work from home will stay in some capacity, I think, for a very long time. Um, you know, security teams, IT teams, mobility teams, whoever handles this, uh, they need to be able to push coverage out over the air. And they need to make sure that, um, you know, they need to make sure they have ways to, uh to access the ability to push that out. They don't want to have to go into the office to push something out from something that's on-prem. Um, and, you know, from, and I think also from a business continuity standpoint, um, it really helps with that because, you know, if, if, uh, if an employee's device is, uh, you know, being slowed down by, by a solution, or sorry, by a uh, security tool of some sort, by an on-prem one, since they usually uh, use more resources um, on the device, uh, you know, they might get frustrated and, and uninstall the solution as a whole, and that just opens up a whole nother can of worms. Um, sure. And then finally, my last my last piece on it uh, would be that um, I'm trying to think what the best. I think it's probably that you know, as you scale up and down, um, the cloud based solutions just offer that much more flexibility. Um, you know, if you're if you're hiring a whole bunch of remote employees, you need a way to be able to to make sure that their access to your to your backend and your resources is safe. Sure. Hank, a, a related issue seems to be the, the, the advent of zero trust in, in so many different security management frameworks, mm -hmm. um, especially with um, the whole work from home scenario, which seems to become the, the dominant networking model, at least for enterprises, and, and the decentralization of security. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how zero trust is being greeted or what, what demand you sense for it in the mobile world. Yeah, I actually, when I get asked about this, I like to bring up a point that our uh, our chief strategy officer made kind of at the start of all this that I think is really interesting. And he said that uh, security teams have gone from monitoring a few offices, you know, maybe a handful of global offices, to now having to secure thousands of home offices. So you just, when you think about it in that kind of almost in a visual way, that, that really, when I heard him say that, it really kind of hit home for me because it's like, yeah, you know, it's not just making sure that all the, you know, the, the hundreds or thousands of devices in one office are, are secure and, you know, basically healthy enough to access the network. It's now going out to everyone's home and making sure that, you know, there's now another layer of uh, added complexity and making sure that, that those devices are again, uh, you know, safe to, safe to access resources. So when you look at it from that point to really implement zero trust, you need to be including mobile devices in that strategy because you think about how interconnected they are. And I mean, like I mentioned at the start of our, of our conversation, you know, there, we all use uh, Google Workspace, Office 365, all these cloud-based productivity collaboration platforms to get work done from home. So you don't want to have, um, you know, to really to really carry out the philosophy of zero trust and assume that no device is safe until proven otherwise, you really need to make sure that 
you can assess the risk of that device before it connects in without, again, without interrupting that kind of continuity in that, in that uh, productivity that, uh, that everyone wants to have from wherever they are. Well, you've, you've certainly got me thinking differently about my iPhone and what I'll be doing after we sign off here. Um, Hank, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. We've been talking with Hank Schles from Security Vendor Lookout. This has been Terry Sweeney for Black Hat. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.